Um, the first thing that I, I, I want to talk about and just point out here is that we have a sequence of, of speakers here that represent different levels of sort of specificity around AI in education. So Arjun is very, very focused on grading, and then you go up one level uh, and, and you get to uh, uh, chatbots and advising and using AI for advising. And then Steve has, has got a platform for education at McGraw-Hill, and then we're all the way up at, at the president of a university. So AI as it relates to different levels of education. The AI this morning was broad in the discussion. What we're going to talk about is its impact on education and maybe think both initially about some of the short-term or near-term implications of the work that we do and then speculate a little bit on, on the future and some of the challenges. So maybe the first question I want to ask, and what came out in the session this morning was that you know, do the machines really learn? Are we really at a point where the machines are far enough in their development that the machines are learning? Is it really intelligence? Is it really artificial intelligence? Or is it more like machine training? Um, I wanted to just ask each of you to talk a little bit about in the work that you're doing, how do you feel about that question? Are we at a point where we're really working with artificial intelligence? Uh, do you feel like the, the, the machines are starting to learn on their own? And then we'll talk about that. Uh, that about a little bit from, from each of our perspectives. Sure, so I can start. Uh, so for us, what we're doing is we're helping instructors grade their work. Uh, so what that means is for really simple questions, like let's say I have a math question, um, you can have 100 students, maybe 80 of them answer the same thing. So we group together answers that are the same to that question, and then rather than grading individually, you can grade the group all at once. Some questions are complicated. Uh, not just like a simple, you know, one number or one word in a box. And for those questions, we let the instructors manually group things together. And so they see all the answers on one screen, they click on all the, all the answers that they want to grade as a group. And when they're doing that, what they're doing is actually also not just grading their work, but also labeling data for us. They're teaching us how to group their work in the future. So although for us right now, that, that learning isn't happening online, um, it's not that the system is immediately going to learn from their um, actions at that moment, you know, in a month or whenever we kind of retrain things, we will learn that. To me, the distinction of immediate online learning versus offline learning kind of from data is actually more of an engineering thing than it is like a philosophical, like is it really learning or is it not learning? Um, it's just about where we are right now with our engineering and kind of what's hooked together to what. And so, I mean, this is, you know, I, <laughs> excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, for me, um, you know, my, my, my background's in, in robotics and again, it's the exact same thing, like online learning and offline learning are extremely similar. It's really just about the engineering there. I'm going to take a slightly different approach to this question. Um, so I would ask maybe philosophically, like, is a, a rat who you teach to run through a maze learning? Um, I, I would actually say, yes, the rat is learning because it's able to understand a pattern. But the fascinating, and, or able to follow its nose and smell something and get to a treat at the end of the, the thing and be able to transfer its ability to run through one maze to another maze. I think that's the, the fundamental question of like, is learning happening? Like, can you, from a huge data set, learn something that then you can transfer to a similar domain that has different parameters and still be able to succeed? And the example I would cite um, that's truly like revolutionary is AlphaGo, which is um, uh, Google's or the DeepMind team in London which built a computer program that beat the world champion in Go. And I would point to one move. There's one move. I think it's move 37 in game two, uh, which as they were watching this game unfold, uh, all the experts were like, oh, the machine blew it. It made the wrong move. That's clearly the dumbest move. And it turns out that as the game progressed, that was the, the fundamental move that allowed it to win the game. And they still, this move had never been made before and not in any of the data sets that they had used to train this model, uh, but it was able to infer this move uh, and execute it. Uh, and the, the ter sort of like scary thing about the technology is that the people who build these convolutional neural nets feed the data in, and like if you peel back the hood, what you have are a set of neurons, uh, and there's information coded in them, and even the engineers who like understand this better than anyone in the world don't fully understand what information is coded, in, for instance, in an individual neuron. Um, so it's fascinating and astounding, but that's still just one example of the ability to do that. Uh, most of the time, you're just taking a huge data set, distilling it down to patterns and recognizing patterns. Um, but I would say that we are on the cusp of something very exciting and cool. Uh, 
what shape that will take is a different story. But anyway, I won't monopolize. I'm curious to hear what you guys have to say. No, I, mean, I think both my colleagues have expressed really powerful view, views of what could be. Um, can machines learn? I think that was the question. In some cases, in this conference in particular, I'm wondering if that's the relevant question. I think the real question is, how do we help students succeed? Hmm. How do we help teachers have that social, emotional relationship to students? Because I don't think anybody's going to remember their AI program 15 years after <laughs> high school. But they sure as heck are going to remember the teacher who inspired them to go into software engineering. And I think the beautiful thing that we have now, and I think we are, we are on the verge of some great breakthroughs built on many, many decades of research, is that certainly software today and compute power today can work in service of great teachers to help them create confident students. And so what do I mean by that? So I'm fortunate that we work with, a AI or with an algorithmically driven uh, platform called Alex that helps kids become confident in math. But if I just put Alex out there without a teacher, without a curriculum, without thoughtful pedagogical design, it doesn't do very much. When I wrap all of that around that, Alex is a true accelerator for better outcomes. It saves the teacher time from rote tasks of grading and it gives them more opportunity to reflect and to group and to guide and to remediate and to accelerate students. For the student, it avoids the two ruts of boredom and frustration by pushing them down this confident roadway of what to challenge next. Now, is Alex learning in the spirit of Bloom's? Is Alex taking mathematics and transforming it into some new form of mathematics that's never been invented before? It's not. Is Alex a powerful environment in which to provide insights and inferences and recommendations? It is. So I don't know if it's learning or not, but I know that that software, as one example, plays a meaningful role in an educational ecosystem of people and software. I think that's pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah, the, the one thing I would add to the conversation about the question of whether they learn or not, I, I'm not sure that we or I uh, particularly care whether they learn or not. What I do know is, is that they are incredibly helpful of helping us answer questions that we need to answer, uh, particularly as it relates to student progress, student outcomes, everything else like that. Uh, if I were to answer the question as to whether the machines themselves actually learned, I think they're incredibly good at answering questions or solving problems. I don't think they're actually really good at even identifying the questions that need to be asked. And I think that's part of the learning that has to happen. It says, given the confluence of the data, given all the things that are being observed, given all the information that's available to you, what is going on anyway? And why does it matter? And what are the questions we should be asking to them we can solve for? And I think in our context of uh, improving student outcomes, uh, I think we're still relying upon the humans to identify even the questions that should be asked and then leveraging the machines and all the data that we're gathering to start answering those questions. Um, I'm not seeing anything today that really gives good evidence that the machines know what questions to ask. I think they're incredibly powerful in terms of identifying all the patterns that exist and the amount, masses of data that we're using, particularly at WGU, that they can sift through stuff at levels that uh, we uh, just humans can't. Um, and so that has huge promise. I don't know whether that's learning or not, but what I do know is it's problem solving. Absolutely. And we're definitely solving for problems around student outcomes and student progress. So. Well, I think one of the, <clears throat> the reasons for framing it this way is because this is a, a panel on our artificial intelligence, right? Which, which as a term is obviously sort of a phantasmagorical buzzword yeah. kind of term that has lots of meanings to different people. So right. sort of trying to provide yeah. a framework. And some of what you all are saying is, is we're, we're, do, we're, you know, we're, we're using data to, to make better decisions. It was said in one of the earlier sessions, if we're making better decisions and smarter decisions, perhaps that's contributing to our intelligence or that has some intelligence to it. Um, you know, maybe just pick up a little bit further. In your work, you, you say you feel more strongly about how um, the machines are contributing. How, how are you seeing that in the, in the work at AdmitHub and with chatbots? Oh, um, thanks. I wasn't expecting that question to me. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, we uh, have a conversational agent, basically a virtual assistant that's able to 
ask questions of our users, gather data, and then when they ask us questions, answer. So you're absolutely right, uh, Scott. When we craft the questions to ask them, that is scripted. We are having subject matter experts guide them on a basically a choose your own adventure story through a process that we know extremely well. The part where the AI comes in is when they go off the rails and start asking us questions. Yeah. Uh, and what we are able to do is understand the language. And we can understand, and the really fascinating part of the AI uh, component is that it is able to understand the, the language through a statistical model. And boy, to, um, I can get into the weeds a little bit. Um, and I can explain to you that if you feed a great deal of language into a convolutional neural net, it will assign a value, uh, which is basically, for all those who studied physics, a vector, which is a line with a direction and a magnitude. And each word has its own vector. And you can simply add vectors together. And the resulting vector is the meaning of the sentence. And whether you get there by any path, the sentences are synonyms. And by doing so, we are able to graph question topics and be able to understand. You might have asked this in a dramatically different way than we've ever seen before, but we have a high confidence that you're asking about you know, FAFSA completion, uh, even though you worded it differently than we've ever seen. Uh, and so that part is the exciting AI part where we're able to grow and understand language very quickly and support students even though they ask the darndest things. Uh, and, and we're able to train it uh, to get smarter the more people use it, which is very exciting. And so um, when you, you talked a little bit about in some of our conversations before, the leverage in that. So how many students can you work with that you wouldn't be able to work with in a different model? How does that, how does that work? Oh, well, yeah, I, I can, I will, I'm gonna give a brief plug for the panel that's tomorrow in this exact same room at 10 a.m. Uh, so I don't wanna get too far into the weeds uh, because I think there's more important things to talk about than what I do. Um, but we help people radically scale student support. And like you said, Scott, um, these things don't work on their own. You need people and you need to wrap um, a whole support system around it. But when you do give the software to a person who communicates with students, you dramatically, about 10x increase the number of conversations you can have simultaneously. Um, right now we max out, uh, one person can do about 3,000 simultaneous text chats um, with students, which is pretty gnarly to see uh, in action. I built the thing and I almost didn't believe it until I saw it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's basically the multiplier effect, but it will not work effectively without people at the helm. Absolutely. So if each of you could talk about now, like what is the, when you think about these technologies, what are the most exciting things in sort of the near-term scope that you see? And then we can turn to like, looking at a little more system-wide, what do we see five and 10 years down the road? But right now, in terms of what's in front of us, what the technologies make possible right now, what's most exciting? What do you see as the most exciting impact on education from your perspectives? So I think, the, I think the thing that I think is most interesting is um, some new methods that are being, being developed to learn from a much smaller amount of data and being able to generalize to new things very quickly. So for us, um, in grading, we can work on some simple types of questions today, like short answers, math, or text, or something. But with some new things that people are working on, uh, we could, even with a smaller amount of data, apply it to things like chemical molecule diagrams or economic supply demand curves or something like that. And so it's just um, people are working on how do you transfer uh, experiences from this domain to that domain with a really, really, really small amount of data. And that dramatically changes uh, the, the, the scope and the scale at which we can actually apply things at. And I think that's going to affect how things work, not just for us in grading, but all sorts of things in education. Um, I think that might even apply to a lot of the things that everybody here works on. Um, as you can expand the scope to things that, you know, you might see the same question 10,000 times right now, and maybe that's kind of where you need to be. I'm not trying to put, <laughs> no, put a fine. number on you. Uh, but maybe in, you know, in a couple of years, you can do interesting things with 10 answers or, or 10, 10 questions repeated. So I think that's really interesting to me. Steve? Sure. How many of you have taught? Raise your hands. <clears throat> so my first experience teaching was, gosh, about 20 years ago. I ran technology and innovation for Babson College, and two days before the course, problem solving and software design for business students was to be taught, my provost came to me and said, congratulations, you're teaching the course. 
because the faculty member who was supposed to teach it had had a medical emergency. I had never taught before. I didn't know the course. I was lucky Babson's a very small and intimate college, so I only had 50 kids in the course. I wasn't in open access where I might have had 500 in the course, so I could fake it a little bit. At the end of the course one night, I was in my office just grading final after final after final after final. I was there a long time. A very seasoned faculty member walked by me four times, and that's about 10 o'clock at night. He said, Stephen, what are you doing here? He said, I'm grading finals. He said, it's a lot of work, isn't it? I said, it is. He said, well, why are you grading them? <laughs> and I was stumped at the question. And he goes, well, don't you understand your distribution? He's like, I'm still stumped. He said, well, you've had this many grade points in your semester, probably about five of them throughout the semester. And there's some number of students that regardless of what they did on your final, they're going to pass and their grade won't change. Don't grade those. It's a bad use of your time. How many of you have kids today who are in either K-12 or college? What do you think their world would feel like if they got feedback twice a semester? If twice a semester they were told how they were doing? Now think about today's community college, open access college today's large urban high school. For better or for worse, and I think it's for better, our kids today need much more feedback to be successful. And I think that's a good thing. One who believes in frequent grading and feedback. I think what you're hearing about is software that really enables that to happen at scale. Able to do it in cost structures that society can afford able to do it in ways that allow really dedicated folks to be master teachers because they're armed with insights. They're armed with understanding about how did they deliver this idea? How is this homework assignment happening? And that information, thanks to the innovations that are happening, is presented to them versus them spending hours and hours and hours of rote activity trying to gin up that data through hand grading and hand feedback. And so what I'm most excited about today is what you guys are talking about, what we have in market, what Western Governors does with these kinds of capabilities, and that's to take them in purposeful ways to create many more opportunities for feedback and guidance. And I think one of the things that I worry about, because you didn't ask that, is let's not worry about Hal, right? Hal's not going to become our teacher anytime soon. And the more we worry about what is AI really doing, the less we focus on right, what's right in front of us today. So you can grade essays today. You can have personalized math lessons today. You can have these really powerful dashboards today that show how to pull students out into small group instruction, all thanks to these really tuned and curated algorithms that work pretty well today and are getting better. Um. Fascinating, I would say in general. You know, like, so you, I think it's uh, very exciting what uh, you were just talking about, Stephen. But I think uh, what I would say is that uh, we actually see more progress happening today in the advancement of learning than anything else. Um, and if I were to think about generally the purpose of a university, I'd uh, arguably put it into very simply into two camps. One, the advancement of knowledge, that which we know about the world in which we live, you know, everything that we have about, about science and humanities and, and you know, problem solving, everything that we could possibly know, one of the purposes that universities have is to advance knowledge, but that's not the only place that that happens. Arguably, the 200 plus research universities in the US, that's primarily what they do. Mm. The other primary purpose, and what we believe more than, in than anything else, is the transfer of that knowledge from those that have it to those who need it, uh, to pursue whatever they want to do in their lives. And this is where we at WGU are fundamentally different than the uh, centuries old model of higher education. And I think we're different because of what artificial intelligence and machine learning and big data and technology in general is doing to change the nature of how we learn. Uh, I think it's in this particular area where we see more advancement occurring in the next decade or, or, or even in the next five years than anywhere else. Why? Because uh, what, what we now know about what individuals do to learn, to actually improve their cognition, 
that uh, they not only can problem solve, but they also know the questions to ask, so they advance their own learning. That in many ways, it's analogous to self-driving vehicles, that it's self-regulated learning. And in fact, I, as the learner, am in a better position to uh, advance my progress than any teacher is. Because in fact, the technology and the big data and everything else, all the things that it's kind of consuming to see how me, how I individually advance, it has much more information to adapt the process of learning than any one faculty member ever would. It's the same as you think about a self-driving car. If you're trying to get to a destination, what self-driving cars can incorporate in terms of the data to solve for that outcome is way more that you sitting in the driver's seat can do at any one point in time. You may see you know, 360 degrees around you, but you can't see traffic in front of you, you can't see alternate patterns, you can't see whatever else is going on, accidents, everything else. All that data is available to the car to do that and can drive a better outcome than what a human can do. The same we think is true for learning, that individuals learn at different paces, they come with different knowledge, they learn in different ways, and that when you enable the entire journey of learning, utilizing technology, you're now amassing so much information that the science of that is going to far exceed the intuition of any one individual faculty member. So much so that we absolutely believe that in particular topical or subject matter areas that you could absolutely do it completely absent faculty. That you can gamify the heck out of certain topical areas. That you can use uh, technology-enabled models, virtual reality, nudges, whatever it may be. The individual could advance their learning outcome much more effectively than inserting faculty engagement or lecture models or whatever it may be. So that's just, I think, one area where we just generally see technology and big data and machine learning so significantly uh, bringing, if you will, knowledge to the masses in a way that our society in the US needs it and quite frankly, the world needs it. Uh, because last I checked, we need you know, 35 million more adults in the US with post-secondary credentials. That's right. And we don't seem to have the capacity to do it with the current system. Well, who said the current system is the way we're going to do it? Um, so I think that's in learning in general is, I think, where we believe that science is, uh, technology-enabled science is going to dramatically change how learning happens. So. So you hit on a couple of hot button issues there uh, <laughs> uh, that I, I think Thanks. we probably ought to address. Um, so uh, so we'll, come, we'll come back and, and, and talk about the one, uh, you know, everyone today that I've seen has said, no, it's not a replacement. You said in some cases it can be a replacement. But one thing I want to hit on really quickly is that the 80,000 students at WGU or thereabouts, right, enrollment. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that, that comes up sometimes is we need to, we need to train uh, and, and educate uh, a, a population that's um, maybe first generation college students, uh, uh, have, have less resources, uh, work in five jobs. You have many quote unquote non-traditional students. Um, some people worry that this is gonna be the second you know, the second string education, the second tier education, you know, they, they get the machines and the robots and, and the wealthy people get the, the supplemented human interaction. What, what is your take on, on that question first, uh, given that you have a direct experience working with those? Uh, I would say that that's an incredibly short-sighted view. Um, uh, if, you, if we don't believe that technology is gonna enable the future of learning, then when, in fact you're gonna be trapped and disrupted very quickly. Um, and the reason I say that is because uh, we as individuals are already being shaped so much by how we utilize technology in all other facets of our daily lives. Uh, it's not hard to see how even mobile devices themselves are changing how individuals interact with content that's part of their learning experience in a classroom or otherwise. Um, I, so I, I would say that uh, it, it is also, um, it's somewhat elitist to think that in fact technology-enabled learning is a second-tier thing. Because I would argue that the technology-enabled learning is actually advancing learning in a way that the traditional model could never do. Uh, that's even the idea behind the notion of a flipped classroom. That so much learning can occur outside of the classroom. So how do you utilize the classroom now to augment all the learning that occurred elsewhere? Versus the classroom being the primary place that learning is supposed to occur and, occur, and then you go outside to try to apply that learning. Well, guess what? Individuals are learning all the time, especially if all the content is available to them 24-7. So how are you utilizing all that so that the classroom itself becomes much richer in terms of how you're augmenting the student experience in it to really start advancing how 
Cognition develops, it develops how application of learning helps, advances how you get peer-to-peer -peer interaction and project-based work, to, et cetera, that it now is in some way leveraging that technology in a way that becomes, guess what, it doesn't matter whether you're you know, privileged or not, it doesn't matter whether you have one ethnic background or other, it doesn't matter whether you're rural or urban, it doesn't matter, there is some degree of commoditization of knowledge that says, all those barriers that used to exist are being removed at a pace faster than, than incumbents may realize. And if, and if we don't stay, if they don't stay in pace with it, you're gonna end up in that, guess what, I got disrupted camp. Stephen. Yeah, and, and building on that and agreeing with, with those comments, I think, you know, it's funny, I was um, asked to join the board of the Online Learning Consortium back in 2001. And there the question is, is online learning legitimate, right? And it's, got, it's of course gonna cheapen education and there'll be the education for the rich which will be on campus and the education for the poor will be online. That was what, 17 years ago. And obviously that didn't pan out. And in fact, uh, the majority of college kids today take at least one to two courses online. And in fact, there's research that says a really well-designed online course can exceed a traditional lecture course. And so it's not this binary world, unfortunately. What it is is there are beautiful shades of gray and beautiful opportunities to construct learning experiences today that are creative and that drive access. And drive access because they're, frankly, more efficient to deliver. And they're bringing costs down. So yeah, there can be some terrible learning experiences, I'm sure, that are done with software. Just like there can be some really terrible lecture courses that people go to. So maybe that's not the question. And maybe the question is, how do the pedagogies innovate? How do we create safe spaces to take the first year of college and move it fully online, right? Such as what ASU is doing. How do we create the ability for the learning transcript to be mine and not an institution so it travels with me? And so it is this collection of smaller experiences that demonstrate my ability to whoever I want to show it to. And the truth is, for the foreseeable future, you know, I can only go out about five years in my planning horizon because I promised myself I'd never think farther out than that because I never believe anybody who does. Because when you hear them five years later, you come back and none of their predictions were right. <laughs> what I can say is that it's a real mashup of opportunities. And I think that's a good thing. Um, and I don't think it's rich versus poor. I don't think it's high quality versus low quality. Some of the best learning I've personally done have been both in a classroom and online. I was at a different stage of my life. I had different learning goals, and that's pretty cool. So I think it's a messy answer. I think the real <coughs> question is, are we as a community creating the moments for experimentation? And as we think about the inertia of the current and the way we think about the current, and we think about all the structures that we have in place that frankly slow down change. The question is what can we do to make change easier to envision, to try out, and then to scale? And I think that's what we are ourselves right now. So I think that's, so we were talking there about students and how the students experience can be different with these different technologies. And the other hot button you hit was related to the faculty and the professorate. So, uh, and a, the question of change comes up both from the standpoint of the faculty and from the institutions that, that where they work. So I think the obvious next question is, you know, you, you brought the car analogy. There's a lot of fear about jobs being lost and all that. Do we think that the jobs are gonna, that we're gonna have five years from now, fewer faculty jobs, same number of faculty jobs? Do they go away or do they just change? Do they have to do a different type of job and, and evolve to that? And I, I'd open that to everyone just to speculate. Nobody's an expert on this question, really. Do I have a question? Should, on that? Go ahead. Um, so I think an interesting analogy is, so when the first uh, uh, chess program uh, built by IBM beat the world master, uh, Gary Kasparov, everyone was like, oh, chess is over. Like, no one's going to play chess anymore. The machines have won. They've taken it from us. Um, and of course, we still play chess. And actually, the, f the fascinating thing is that the chess championships now are a hybrid of the best players and their AIs. Like, I am a, if I'm a grandmaster, I bring my AI to the match, and we both play you and your AI. 
Uh, and the idea is this augmented game, which is played at a whole nother level than humans or machines could ever participate in. And I don't think we should think about this technology as ever replacing people so much as tapping into the power that it can bring if we work together with it. Um, otherwise, we'll end up smashing the machines with pitchforks. And no one wants to see that. Uh, the machine uprising. <laughs> um, and, and, and with respect to jobs uh, outside of higher ed, do you mind if I touch on that Whatever. for a minute? Um, I mean, this is a real risk. I think this is the greatest risk uh, with, when it comes to AI is there are going to be self-driving vehicles. Uh, and if this dramatic technology replaces, let's say, trucking, that could displace, uh, let's say, a million jobs. Um, imagine that it replaces just low-level customer support in various other industries. We're, we're talking about millions more jobs. I mean, what we are on is the cusp of an industrial, industrial revolution, but instead of for manual labor, it's for knowledge work. And this is going to necessitate a dramatic shift in what people do, and to have that dramatic shift, the only hope is education. And I am, based on what you guys have just said, I've actually been like transformed right now, the eureka moment. Like, historically, education is not the place for technology to get a stronghold and, and branch out. But I actually feel like the people in this room, the people who share this stage with me, we can bring this technology to bear on the educational experience and dramatically accelerate in, uh, what it means to learn and improve yourself uh, and gain skills and, and knowledge that we will be able to stay ahead of the curve uh, and be able to retrain workers and fashion the society that will be suitable for the future, which I can't imagine. Uh, but I know something big is on the horizon in terms of change, and the only way we can confront it uh, is together. That's what I would say. Okay. So I'm from uh, the question, particularly as it relates to faculty, I would at least say this, is that it goes back to this notion of can they learn. The, we, we had some fundamental questions that I think we were asking about learning and how what role faculty plays in that learning. So the questions we are asking ourselves all the time are, which interactions between faculty and student advance learning? And when you start to try to answer that question, one of the first things you start doing is like, well, how do we measure whether or not different interactions are actually adding value? Great, let's start then solving for that problem. Are we collecting the data to answer which of those interactions matter and everything else? And if we collect that data, and what does the data tell us? Great. So. How do we improve those interactions and do more of those versus stopping these interactions? And I think what you'd also research is that WGU believes fundamentally in the value add of incredible faculty in the advancement of learning. But it wants the faculty to be working on those value added interactions versus the non-value added interactions. And there I would say that there's pretty good evidence that lectures to 700 students in a classroom aren't incredibly valuable in terms of advancing cognition. So, in our context, if you looked at WGU, one of the first things we designed was a disaggregated faculty model because we started looking at the interactions that really advance the learning of our students. And we're starting to give more information and data to the faculty themselves so they can make better decisions about how they engage with individual students, by the way. Not 100 at the same time, but how do I work with you individually? If you also look at our overall headcount model, I don't know if there's anyone who invests in more faculty headcount as a percentage of our total headcount than WGU it constitutes 70% of, of our total headcount. We're hiring nearly 100 faculty every month. Um, and so the question we're asking, and I think you could ask in any aspect of a process, is which interactions matter? And then how do you enable that to happen at a human, in the human context, and let the machines do the ones that don't matter that much? And even let the machines help answer which interactions matter. And so that's how we've kind of approached the problem. Rather than answering a question as like, oh, does this have an impact or jobs or not? I will say just broadly on the driving thing, I'm perfectly okay with machines disrupting our you know, economy and our job model to say, hey, if, we're, if there are certain things that are better at, that, at doing, then that frees up a lot of talent to solve bigger problems that we don't have the capacity to solve today. Um, so I'm personally comfortable with the fact that self-driving vehicles may mean that uh, millions of adult males in the US need to find a new employment. So, 
So I, I think we've got a pretty um, so we've got a pretty enthusiastic group here in terms of looking at that. When you think about fears or things that you're concerned about, what would you highlight as the top concerns you see looking ahead? I so. think it's the, the resistance we put up to the change. So I think you could e this could have easily been a very different conversation of fear mongering and, and, and gone in a very different direction. It hasn't. It's kind of cool that it hasn't. They haven't run yet. They haven't run yet. <laughs> um, I think you can see today and you can see a really positive end state where society's gotten to a better point. The artful balance is through the transition, right? And this is a transition that's a multi-generational transition if any of our other big tr prior transitions are a guide, even though technology does move faster. So my fear is we don't, number one, recognize it's not, is this going to happen or not happen? It's happening. So then the real question is, what do we do to contribute to make this transition as equitable as possible within society? Because what we do know is if, the, if history is a guide, if this transition comes for periods of time with big winners and big losers, it's a really destabilizing transition. So if we do have a million 50-year-old men who have nothing to do for 10 years, that doesn't feel right. Yeah. And so what WGU is doing, what others are doing, and really being thoughtful about how are we going to move to a society that's about continuous learning. It is about tra helping people transform and finding ways to contribute, then this is kind of cool, right? And this feels very good. And so my fear is, is that we may be spending too much time on what are these machines going to do? Is this going to be good or bad? Versus just acknowledging we're in change. And so how do we make that change really equitable and, and make the journey through it as positive as what the end result if we ever get there, might be. I think that's exactly right. And um, as I've talked to people, I've heard three different kind of common fears about AI. Uh, one is, are we building Skynet? And no, we're not building Skynet, so we can skip that one. <laughs> the second is the one that you just brought up, is are they going to take our jobs, or you know, how do we handle that? And it's exactly what you said. We just have to accept that there are going to be jobs that are displaced. We need to figure out how to handle that tr transition smoothly. And the third is, is the AI going to make a mistake? Is that mistake potentially going to kill somebody? And the answer is that, yeah, there's going to be a self-driving car, and it's going to make a mistake, and that, that could lead to a loss of life. And, you know, overall, there are going to be fewer deaths due to self-driving cars, but we're going to have to accept that there's going to be mistakes, and a human in that position might not have made that mistake. And it's going to be a varied on a case-by-case -case basis. For grading, a mistake isn't anywhere nearly as, uh, as big of a deal as for a self-driving car, but these things have to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis, and we have to figure out how to culturally just accept that even a human in that position, even though that, that human may not have made that mistake, in the aggregate, we are in a better place than we were before. Yeah, that's a probabilities argument, um, which is a valuable argument until you're on the 1% side, right? Yes, yes um, exactly. So I do want to touch on one issue. It didn't come up in the other panels, and I think it's a really important issue. I think it plays into both the university environment and the commercial environment, and that's privacy. So, Obviously, everything we do now leaves a trail. Everything's trackable. Um, how do you all feel about how do you manage privacy at the same time that you're collecting all these data? Uh, what do you think is most important to maintain? What, what worries you about privacy? I think a lot of people are worried about that, obviously, in today's environment. Maybe each of you could touch on that briefly. I think the biggest thing is it just needs to be transparent. Um, what are you collecting? Is there a way for you to get it off your system? Um, just make the policies very clear. Um, ideally, opt in as much as possible. Um, that's, that's kind of the short-term thing. It's just it's got to be transparent. You need to know what you're in control of, what you're giving up for using whatever system it might be. Um, and I just want to touch on, in the long term, is there actually some really cool work happening on how to do these kinds of things cryptographically? So in five, ten years, it might be the case that you're in full control of your data, and you, the algorithms actually work on encrypted versions of it and still learning the exact same thing out of it. And so there's a lot of work going into that from a bunch of different labs, and you know, hopefully, Five years from now, it's just not even a question anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very cool. If using like blockchain, for instance, to encrypt things. Um, I mean, we have laws in place uh, that protect data. Uh, and I'm going to say something that might sound weird. Um, but I think they're way behind the times. Um, for instance, uh, so I can s 
take student data, for example, uh, a lot of it, and then I can run it through a convolutional neural net, and it outputs, <laughs> you should see the output, it's just a, a matrix of numbers. <laughs> Random numbers, positive and negative, uh, with long decimal points, and you're like, how could that be anything? But is a statistical representation of the data we've fed in. And the very interesting thing is the model itself is the intelligent thing, and once you have the model, you no longer need the data. Um, and I think we need uh, the profound shift needs to be around what we do with these models because they are incredibly powerful, and if they are derived from, for instance, public data, I think the model itself needs to be made public um, because that gives a very unfair advantage to the people who possess that model. Uh, and if you give proprietary access to someone who has, uses, for instance, public data sets from K-12 education, if they get access to a lot of data, I think it should be a mandate um, that their model be made public as well. Um, and right now, we don't have any ability to share these models. There's no you know, GitHub for sharing machine learning models, but there probably needs to be a better way to distribute the wealth of knowledge when it comes to the, um, I guess, the innovation of the technology itself uh, from an engineering perspective. But, but just, I just want to introduce something as we keep going on the line. Uh, that's very aggregated data. Make sure I, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but where the real impact is is when it's personalized, right? When the interventions are at the individual personal level, you have to have some information about that personal uh, trajectory for that student over yes. time to intervene at that spot with the right kind of intervention. So you have to have, that data is somewhere at that, at that moment, right? So I just wanted to reintroduce that part of it and yes. how, do we, how do we manage that, that part of it? Yeah, and it does exist at moments in time. And building on, on prior comments, we have an obligation to limit that. So to really store that, you know, it goes back to it is the student's data. And it goes back to education is a safe place, you know. And I'm proud to say that in the mid-'80s at Bowdoin College, my thesis was that, you know, the Constitution is bunk. And I'm glad Google didn't exist then, and I'm glad <laughs> it's not out there, because I wrote a bunch of stuff. I didn't believe, but my con law professor so got under my skin that I wrote this for him to see what his reaction would be. And that was cool. And it was safe. And then what nobody would ever know is at the end of the semester, Professor Morgan and I went out to dinner and laughed about it, right? The other half of the story. So there is a deep responsibility for us as creators of technology and us as enablers of institutions to extend that umbrella to the best of our ability and to understand you know, the power that we have to help education and the destruction that can happen when information about a person is inadvertently misused. It can shape their whole future. I do think both our laws and our technology are trying to catch up. I'm glad I'm not running in any election these days. I'd be hacked. Um, and I do think the final thing, though, is because I think we're going to be in this messy period of time where bad actors are going to leapfrog good actors and we're going to iterate through good and bad cycles. I think the other part of the story is we have an obligation to really teach better information literacy. So let's assume they're going to be privacy laps even through best efforts, and they'll happen. The question is, as a society, how do we understand them? How do we understand the derivatives that come out of them, much of which are fake and propaganda? And so, you know, full circle again. In the 19th century, there was a big push to understand propaganda and what, what's real and what's not. We've accelerated those cycles, but it's the same issue of information literacy. That's got to be another leg of this conversation. Scott? The, uh, I think the data, I, it freaks me out, quite frankly. Um, and I think it freaks me out because, in fact, there is a generation of individuals who seem to be very open with their information about themselves. Um, and it freaks me out because I don't think they've yet realized what uh, all the other nefarious uh, you know, purposes that other individuals who want to then use that data for a lot of uh, untoward causes. Um, but the reason it freaks me out because I think what it's actually done for institutions like ourselves or anyone who's collecting a lot of personal, personal identifiable information or even uh, more uh, secure information too around PCI data, it, it, 
places the onus on us as an institution, and I actually think that's the wrong place to put it. I actually think it should be on the individual. But the challenge with that is there is no actual good uh, system other than the promise potentially of blockchain that says, I actually own all my data. And it's in token form. And I'm gonna use that token form regardless of, uh, regardless of what entity in what facet of life, whether it's uh, in education or whether it's in commerce or whether it's in health and medical care or whatever it is, that I'm making my own decision about whether or not I wanna share my information that I own with you as a service provider to me. Unfortunately, the one that I rely upon holding that more than anyone else right now is quite frankly Amazon. Um, I trust my information with Amazon more than I trust it with anyone else uh, because of how they protect that information for what they use. I would never trust Facebook with it. I wouldn't trust Google with it. I wouldn't trust anyone else with it. Quite frankly, I'm worried every time I, I would give it to a medical provider or anyone else. And the problem is, is you've now created so many inputs of your data out there, it's impossible for the individual to control that and it puts it on the onus of WGU2. So what are we left to do? We're left to try to build our own security around that, management of all that data, encrypting all that information and everything else. But guess what? All we're doing is our database of information keeps building. We are increasingly going to be a target of those that have nefarious purposes. So it freaks me out because I don't think blockchain technology or alternate forms of individuals owning and possessing their token of their data is advancing quickly enough to where it can shift from the enterprises to the individual. Because then the individual is still left with their own liberty and agency to decide whether or not I want to share my data with you as a service provider to me. But now, what, where is that standard? It, in, in effect, becomes a currency. So we have to get there. I, I will say that there's a huge onus on enterprises who are serving hundreds of thousands of uh, customers, if not millions of customers, because you are now have data that, in fact, uh, others rely upon heavily. And we're not the only one possessing that data. There's 25 other ones that do it. So I don't think there's a good solve to it yet. It, it is an area that uh, if you're an enterprising uh, you know, technology startup, if you want to go con you know, really advance the, uh, the global community out there, you would solve for something like a blockchain technology around individual data. So I'm looking at the, the clock with 58 seconds left and thinking, ah, I should have asked that question a little bit earlier and <laughs> finish on, on yeah. an upbeat. I, I, do think, I do think, though, that this question of the right balance is, is really super critical um, because right now I think commercial firms in some sense have an advantage. Um, they're, they're less conservative about their management of data, which is risky, but it also means that they can use those data to improve their systems. And our, you know, our private nonprofit higher education system is extremely conservative, mm -hmm. understandably so. Like, we're gonna throw out the data, we're not gonna look at the data, libraries throw out all circulation data. It puts that group at a huge disadvantage, you know, quote unquote, competitively, in terms of adapting and improving their system. So, so finding that balance, that right level of protection for the data, sharing of the data, maybe in data <laughs> repositories that are, that are protected, feels like a very important uh, a thing for us as a community to keep the kinds of positive things we were talking about in the middle of this moving forward and not, not be handicapped yes. or paralyzed by that. To be fair, that. I think in our, in our particular case with our students, it is one of those cases where if they were told to say, listen, the more information you share with us about your engagement across all aspects of your journey, the better we are able to individualize the learning to you so it increases the probability of an outcome that you came here for in the first right. place but then it's still clear to them is that that's what they're opting into today with us, is that we're utilizing all this to advance our purposes to help you achieve that outcome, but they should still be in control of that choice. They are, but it still puts a big onus on us. It's like, well, when do they go to the next one and what service are they providing and can I opt into that service? I think in general, you know, most of the individuals are, I think are virtue guided individuals, meaning that we're mostly trying to do the right thing so that we as consumers of services are saying, yeah, I want to opt into that because I recognize that if you have my data, that you can better serve me. I want that. So I want better service. I don't want less service. So I'm willing to give up some privacy to say I want better service. But if it, for any reason I don't want that anymore, I should be able to take it back with pretty quickly as well. Yeah, Arjun pointed out the, the value of the transparency and, and opt-in. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't have time to figure out all the implications every yeah. time. You know, none of us do. So you need I think we're for that. 
What's that? We need a bot for that. Yeah, yeah, you need, yeah, yeah, you need service your, for yeah, you. I, 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 in my, my head, I've changed AI to mean assistive uh, uh, intelligence. Yeah. Good uh, change. Part so, of the transparency, sorry, part of the transparency is getting that stuff out of these like, you know, 500 paragraphs of stuff you've got to go right, through exactly. and making it very clear to you, though. Exactly, exactly, so. making it clear. Uh, I'd like to just thank our panelists. Uh,